are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Great to see you all here this morning. Uh, those of you who are new, we're, we're in a series right now called Family Matters, which you hopefully have picked up by now. Uh, we're doing an interactive thing, which means if you scan that QR code on the front of your notes, we have some moments during the message where you can interact with the message on screen. And so if you'd like to participate in that, I actually got the first question loaded up for you right now. It's a bit of a, a trivia question. I'm curious if you can connect the name of a TV show with the family that's from that TV show, all right? So on your phone, you'll see that trivia on there. There's about eight different questions. You've got to go quick because I got a message to preach. So uh, I'm going to start giving you the answers before you're probably done for that reason. Uh, really glad that you're here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. Uh, for those of you in this room, those watching online, those who are down in the lounge, and those of you online, you can uh, scan the QR code too that you see on your screen and you can uh, participate, all right? So how many of you are done? You were quick enough. You answered all eight questions already. Uh, no? Okay, well, I'm going to start giving you the answers. It's becoming an open book test. All right, the, the, um, the Cleaver family, what, what show were they from? Leave it to Beaver. That's right. What about the Cunningham family? Happy Days. That's right. That was before my time. Um, happy Days. What about the Keaton family? Family Ties. That's right. The Seaver family, Growing Pains, I hear it, yep. Uh, what about the Tanner family? All right, everyone's pretty confident about that one. Uh, the Barone family, everybody loves Raymond. The Connor family, Roseanne, yeah, there's even families like that one, yeah. And then Brady family, Brady Bunch, that was a freebie, right? How many of you got them all right? You're not going to see any answers on the screen, but some of you got them all right. If you got them all right, let me know afterwards so next time my wife and I do a trivia night, we can take you with us because we're, we're terrible at stuff like that. And uh, so we're, we're talking, you know, last week we talked about the, the foundation of every family, right? If you're going to build a house, you want to build it on a firm foundation. And we, we recognize that the foundation we build our family upon is the rock that is Jesus Christ, right? We're going to build our house upon the rock. Now, what we're going to talk about today, now that we have the foundation poured, we're now going to build on top of that foundation the framing of our home, the framing of our family. And one of the things you need to do, you need to be very careful when you put up the framing, is you want to make sure that all of the corners are squared. All right, if you put up the framing and you don't take time to make sure everything's level and squared, it's going to be really hard when you start trying to hang drywall and all that other stuff, right? So we want to make sure that we got the, the framing squared. And so the way we're talking through that today is what we call an atmosphere of honor. Can you say that with me? An atmosphere of honor. We want to build into our family, into our home, an atmosphere of honor and all the different relationships that exist within the family. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to answer a couple questions. What, first one is, what is honor? If we're trying to build an atmosphere of honor, what is that? What are we trying to build an atmosphere of? And then the second question, much more practical how do we actually do that? What are the relationships in the family that God's word tells us we need to show honor to one another in those relationships? We're going to look at that. Question number one is what is honor? What does the Bible say about this word? What is it? Uh, who are we supposed to honor? All that, all right? First Peter 2.17 says it this way. It says, honor everyone. There it is. Right there. Uh, it's pretty clear that the Bible tells us that we're called to show honor to everyone. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Like, well, I thought we were talking about within the family. We'll, call, we'll talk about the family in a minute. But believe it or not, when we're talking about the concept of honor, Scripture tells us that we're called to honor everyone. 
that we're to love the brotherhood, that we're supposed to honor the emperor, that we're, that we're, that we're called to honor everyone. Now, let me explain what, I, what honor means in the dictionary. Later, I'm going to give you the, the kind of the Hebrew definition of it. But in the dictionary, it means to esteem as highly valuable. You know, the Bible tells you that you're supposed to look at other people and you're supposed to esteem them as valuable. They're, you're supposed to ascribe value to them. Why? Have you ever met someone? You're like, man, this person isn't honorable. This person doesn't seem worthy of honor. This, uh, this person is not valuable to me. Uh, you know, it, we encounter people like that all the time. But scripture says that we're supposed to honor everyone. Let me show you why. Let me show you why every single one of us in this room needs to honor every single other person in this room. Genesis 1, 27. Go all the way back to the first chapter in scripture. It says, so God created human beings. Raise your hand real fast if you're one of those. Okay. That's all of us in this room. God created human beings in his own image. And then in case you missed it, he says it again. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, right there in scripture, we get this concept. It's a Latin phrase called imago Dei. Imago Dei simply means that if you are a human being, you are made in the image of God. And therefore, guess what? You are worthy of honor in that alone. You have the image of God in you, and therefore other people ought to honor you for that. And other people have been made in the image of God, so you ought to honor them because they were made in the image of God. That's what scripture says. I want you to understand something real, real important about honor, right? Honor, it recognizes the value in someone else. It doesn't determine it. Honor recognizes value It doesn't determine value. It doesn't really matter whether or not I think you're worthy of value. It doesn't matter if I think you're worthy of honor. The truth is, uh, honor doesn't, it doesn't matter if somebody else recognizes it about you. You are, it's already been established. You were made in the image of God. Simply put, you already have value. Have any of you gotten, uh, maybe been to like a major league baseball game? You get there early enough where you go down and you, 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 you're yelling at your favorite player, hope, hoping he'll come over and maybe sign a baseball you brought. You, know, you go to, I can't, uh, I'm surprised by how expensive baseballs are these days. You go to like Dick's Sporting Goods and buy a brand new baseball. It's like somewhere between 10 and 20 bucks these days. It's expensive, right? You, it, it's already got some value. You know, not a ton, but 10 bucks. But if you go down, right, and you call over your favorite Oriole and you're like, Hey, Adley, come over here. Adley, we love you. Come on, can we just sign my ball? And, and Adley Rushman comes up and he, he, he signs your, your, your baseball and gives it back to you. In that moment, that baseball becomes more valuable. Definitely more valuable to you. Your favorite player just put his autograph on the ball, right? But now you can take that ball and put it on eBay and sell it to someone else. And, and they'll, they'll pay you more than the $10 you paid for it because it has... Uh, you know, a famous baseball player's autograph on it. And you also know there's a truth that if you have an original piece of art and you have the, the, the artist's signature on it, that's pretty valuable, right? And they even say that after the artist dies, it becomes even more valuable. Well, guess what? You were made in the image of God. The creator's signature is on you as a masterpiece of his. And guess what? The creator, the the artist died to add more value to you. You are even more valuable because the creator gave his life for you. And so every single one of us in this room, whether someone has told you that you're valuable or not, I want you to hear this for me. You are valuable and worthy of honor simply because you were made in the image of God. That's all. That's all you need to know. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you guys ever encountered someone that you're like, I don't really feel like honoring this person? Or maybe you've studied someone in history and you're like, well, this person can't be worthy of honor. Or you've come up with some, uh, maybe a person you work with or someone that used to be in your life and you're like, I don't honor this. I want to ask you a question on your phones right now. All right, I'm not going to pop these answers up on the screen because I'm afraid of what you'll type. But... um, 
The question is simply put, who is someone in your life that is difficult to honor? Someone in your life that is difficult to honor. Go ahead and type those for me. I'm going to pop up on my phone some of your answers. You're not going to see uh, each other's. At least you're not supposed to be able to. And hey, do me a favor and don't put names, you know. <laughs> Just call them out by like a title or something like that. You know, I had this problem last service too. You guys are all using up our Wi-Fi. My phone's not updating properly. All right, I don't know what you just typed, but here's my point. It doesn't matter whether or not they're difficult to honor. It doesn't matter what status of a relationship you have with this person. They were made in the image of God. And we all ought to learn how to start seeing people that are difficult to love and difficult to respect as simply that, image bearers of God. In fact, it says in Matthew 5, it says this. If you uh, love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. And what the scripture is reminding us of is I need to learn in my life, and I'm still working on this too, I need to learn how to honor people to, sh- to, to see the image of God in people that are difficult to show honor to. It might be someone who thinks differently than I do, right? It might be someone who votes differently than I do. It might be someone who looks different than I do. In fact, it just might be someone who doesn't like me. And, and at the end of the day, every one of the people who fits in any one of those categories, they're image bearers of God. And so we need to show honor to them. And by the way, quick little side note. Uh, I want you to understand that there's a difference between being an image bearer of God and being a child of God. Every single person you're ever going to encounter is an image bearer of God, made in his image. Only those who have put their faith in Jesus and have walked into a relationship with him through, through putting their faith and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection become children of God. There's a difference. All right, but everyone is worthy of honor simply because, here's your recap, what is honor, right? It's seeing value in others through the image of God in them. And, and like Romans 12, 10 says, love each other with genuine affection, take delight in honoring each other. Everyone is worthy of honor. Uh, So that's your quick little overview of what is honor, right? It's seeing the value in someone else simply because they've been made in the image of God. Now, the second question we're going to talk about this morning is, how do I create an atmosphere of honor in my home, in my family, right? In your home, you're hopefully building upon the solid foundation of, of Jesus Christ, and now as you're building the framing of your home, how are you making sure that your, your home it has square corners? And what we're going to do is we're going to create an atmosphere, a framing structure of honor within our house. Now, you might be thinking, well, if I have to honor everybody, why, why is it? Of course, I got to honor my family. Why, why are we talking about our family? We just talked about everyone, and now you're trying to say, well, here, here's what Scripture says, that there are certain relationships in your life that are worth extra honor. There are some people in your life, the Bible says that you should give double honor to. There are other people that just say it talks about honoring them above those others that you honor. So there are some people in your life that you're supposed to honor more than others. And one of the examples of that is the family. In your family, you should have more honor for the people in your home than you do for those outside of it. We see in scripture, remember God uh, was kind of part of instituting three things, right? He created the family, he created the church, and he created government. And he he had his hands over these three institutions. And we see in scripture that in each of those institutions, those who are leading in those institutions, it says, like about the church in 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says to show double honor 
in uh, the government, Romans 13, 7, it says to honor those who are in authority. And quick reminder for tomorrow, it says also in that verse to pay your taxes. Yeah, some of you are like, wait, that's tomorrow? Yeah. And same thing about the family. God's word tells us that we are supposed to show extra honor to those within our home. And so what do those relationships look like? How do we create an atmosphere of extra honor in our home? Let me show you the first relationship that we're going to talk about this morning is the relationship from children to parents. In other words, the honor that children are expected to show to their parents that's over and above honor that they would show to some random stranger at the grocery store. Uh, let me ask you a quick question on your phones. I'm curious, how many of you, just a yes or no question, the question is this, was it easy to honor your parents growing up? Was it easy to show honor at home to your parents, or did, was it a challenge to show honor to them? As we, we'll pop this up on the screen here in just a minute and see how you guys are answering that. You should see that on your phones. And give me a, all right, they, there we go, 68% so far have said yes. We'll see that number kind of move around as you guys are answering the question. Um, you know what I, I've learned is that when you live in a home where you, you trust your parents, where there's an atmosphere of love, where you know that they have your best interest at heart, it's usually easier in those moments to show honor to your parents. And if you didn't have that, if you didn't have an atmosphere of trust or there was abuse or it was very toxic, you probably are in this 31% that said no. All right, we can pull that down. It's kind of a, uh, it's good to know that most of you came up, I, I would say, probably in healthier homes where it was easier to honor your parents. But you know what scripture doesn't say? It doesn't say honor your parents if you think they're worth it. It doesn't say honor your parents if if they deserved it or it's easy to do. It says honor your parents. So let's look at what it says. In uh, Matthew 5, verse 46 and 47, it says, if you love those, oh, I already read that one. Uh, sorry, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. There it is. Children, obey your parents for you belong to the Lord. And then it says this very clearly, for it is the right thing to do. Don't you love it when scripture just gives you a real clear statement where you don't have to like figure out what it's saying in Greek and, and try to understand like the original, con no, it says simply put, children, obey your parents. This is the right thing to do. If you're a child in this room right now, it is the right thing for you to do to obey your parents. There it is. And then it says this, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. You see that second part is actually a quote from the 10 commandments. The 10 commandments, so now you'll notice there's a few important words on this screen. One says, it says children obey. But then when we fast forward down, it says that honor your father and mother. The Ten Commandments didn't come with any sort of age restriction. There wasn't a, hey, uh, uh, you know, children, uh, make sure that you uh, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Children do this Ten Commandment. Children, do, no, the Ten Commandments are for everybody, regardless of your age. All of us in this room are called to honor our parents, regardless of how old we are and how old our parents are. Now, that first part, though, says, children, obey your parents. You might be thinking, well, when do I stop being in a relationship where I am asked by Scripture to obey? Well, let me tell you what I think about this. I'll, I'll give, you, give it to you blunt. Uh, there, there's a point, right, at, at a wedding where a, a dad will walk his bride down an aisle, and at some point, the officiant, uh, sometimes I get to do this, and I'll look down and say, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the dad will say, her, her mom and I do, or something along those lines. And in that moment, you watch this giving away, and, and this, uh, the way the scripture says it is that you have a man and a wife who become one. They leave their father and mother and cleave to one another. And in that moment, I would say they're still required to honor their parents, but they're no longer required to obey. Now, you might be thinking, well, what if I'm an adult 
and single. I've never been given away or I, I don't have a, a, you know, whatever that, that looks like. Well, let me tell you what I think about that. If you are a single adult and you've left your, uh, the dependency of your parents, you're paying your own bills, you got all that going on, and you're no longer under their authority and you're an adult yourself, well, I would say you're now in a position where you need to honor your father and mother, but you don't need to obey your father and mother. But listen, if you're 35 and you're still living at home, I think you still got to obey. If you're living under my house and I'm providing, I'm paying some of your bills, listen, if you want to be an adult and you want to call your own shots in your life and get a job and move out, right? That's kind of the deal. And so I don't know where you're at in this situation, but scripture says, simply put, that children need to obey their parents and all people need to honor their father and their mother. So this understanding of honor, this atmosphere of honor in the home. Let's look at that, that Ten Commandment verse. In, in Exodus 20, verse 12, remember it says, Honor your father and mother, then you will live long, a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That last part of that verse is kind of interesting, right? I want you to understand that back in like Old Testament days, if you were a child and you did not obey your parents, you did not honor your parents, you dishonored them, it could actually cost you your life. The family would, not the family, you know, the village would take you outside of town and, and potentially stone you to death for dishonoring your parents. And my kids just complain when I take their cell phone away, right? I'm like, listen, you got it easy compared to, you know, what could happen, all right? So just relax. Children need to honor their parents, according to Scripture. We all understand that. Let's look at the second one. Adult children, the relationship of adult children to aging parents. Now, something shifts at some point in your relationship when you are uh, an adult and your parents get to a place where they now need some care and some support and some help from you. What does the Bible say about aging parents? 1 Timothy 5. It says, take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. Scripture says that you are responsible at some point. The way you're going to honor your father and your mother is when they need your assistance and they need help you're going to take care of them, that you're ready to do that. You're ready to partner up with your siblings or partner up with whoever's involved in this process and make sure that your parents are well-loved and cared for. This is pleasing to the Lord. I was, I was telling you the dictionary definition of uh, the word honor, but let me tell you the word that, that the uh, Ten Commandments uses when it says honor your father and mother, that's actually a Hebrew word that means kabed. It's the word kabed. Can you say that with me? Kabed. And the word kabed means weight, like W-E-I-G-H-T, like a weight upon your shoulders, like you're carrying something heavy. And so when it says honor your father and mother, there's this word there that says essentially have a a weightiness, a respect, a, a, an intentional, like that you're, you realize this is something important. I'm trying to understand like this word weight and honor. And the one thing that came to my mind this week, if you've ever been to Arlington, uh, uh, the National Cemetery there, and, and you've, how many of you have ever seen the ex a changing of the guards? If you haven't seen this, you need, to go, you need to go watch this. But you get there and you can stand back at a distance and you get to watch this ceremony where one guard swaps out for another guard. And if you're there, they expect complete silence. And you stand there in silence and you watch this thing go down. And the only way I can explain it is there is a weightiness to the moment. There's something clearly heavy in that moment. And, and it, it's without a doubt what it is. It's a, an atmosphere of honor. You recognize that they're doing this whole pomp and circumstance out of honor for those unnamed soldiers, the tombs of the unknown soldiers. 
who sacrificed their lives, and, and now the, even their families, aren't, they're still in, on, uh, they're, they're not even identified. And so you're standing there in this moment, and you realize there's a weightiness to this ceremony. That's what honor means. It's this kabed that we are called to have, not only for our, our, our parents, but our aging parents. We are meant to care for them and to have that kind of weightiness and to make sure that we recognize this is something that we do that pleases God. Out of curiosity in this room, how, how are you guys currently caring for your parents? If some of you are younger and your parents are healthy. If you look down at your phone, you can answer that question on there. Uh, most of the first service, their parents were still spry and, and individual, living individual lives and didn't need care. But I'm wondering if that, that, that number is a little different here. Uh, how are you currently caring for your parents? And a couple different options. Uh, most of you are saying that your parents are still self-sufficient. That's great. Uh, about 13% or 12%, your parents are deceased. Some of you, 9%, you're starting to make plans. That's an interesting phase of life, isn't it? It's like you're starting to realize that my parents are going to need some help soon, and I'm going to have to have a really hard conversation when I'm like, hey, Dad, give me those keys. <laughs> Like, hey, I don't think you should be driving anymore. Hey, dad, let's figure, hey, you know, mom, let's, uh, you're starting to figure out what that might look like. You're starting to maybe put some money in the bank or uh, figure out a room in the house or figure out what that might look like. That's about 11% of you. And some of you, 4% of you right now are providing direct care in your home for parents. And God bless you for that. I know that's not easy work, but it's pleasing to God. And now, now here's the, the, the 62% up top. My challenge to you, and for those of you who are planning, to make sure that one day you recognize that God has called you, first and foremost, to be the primary provider for your aging parents when they need that care. That's one of the ways we create an atmosphere of honor in the home. All right? Let's go on to, to number three. A third relationship in the home that, that requires extra honor is the relationship of wives to their husbands. Wives showing honor to their husbands. Now we're gonna get to the other one in just a minute. I know some of you are like, whoa, hold up. <laughs> I, I will admit, this is a very difficult topic to preach on. Uh, we live in a world right now that is pretty much like, hey, you know, men and women, we're all the same, and we're all, you know, we're all whatever, and nobody's, nobody's the boss of me, and this, that, and the other. Well, here's what I want to challenge you to think about. Number one, I don't mind stepping on toes. I never have. The church is growing pretty quick, so if we do a seat-thinning sermon every once in a while, that's okay, all right? <laughs> here's what I care about most. I just want to accurately preach the truth of God's Word. I don't really care too much about people's feelings in that, Okay. I certainly care about how people feel and, and trying to be careful to, to balance truth and grace. But the thing that we should be most uh, conscientious of as a church family is that we just want to do what the Bible says, not, uh, not respond by how we feel about it, if that makes sense. And here's what the Bible says. Let me give you one example of a passage of scripture on this. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says, In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Now, that's pretty weighty, isn't it? Whew, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do with that? Some of you are in here like, my, my husband, I, I want to let him lead our family, but he won't. Some of you are like, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to let my husband lead the family. Have you ever met him? You know, like you, and you got like, we're going to talk about this in detail next week. If you're wondering, what does it mean to have an atmosphere of honor between a wife to her husband? What does that look like? We're going to go into detail on that next week. So I want to invite you to come back. It's going to be a tough message to, to preach, but, you know, the, God's word is what it is. I'm, you know, we're a, 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 it's not an essential of faith, but I'm, as your pastor, I'm a complementarian. I believe that God has created men and women with unique, different roles, and that men are called to lead in the home. That's my perspective. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. And so one of the best ways... Just if you can't come next week and you just got one little bit of information here, one of the best ways wives can honor their husbands is to let them lead in the home. Let them lead the family. Let them train up uh, 
and, and guide the children toward in, in godliness. Let them have that responsibility. If they're not claiming that responsibility, don't want that responsibility, pray that out of them, you know? <laughs> Join, have some other people surround you and say, I need to pray because I want my husband to, to lead us, but he won't, all right? We can, we can help you with that. But here, here's what I can say. It's kind of one of my, my favorite funny verses in scripture. Proverbs 21 verse 19 says, it is better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome complaining wife. That's what scripture says. And can I just say in my home, I've never wanted to live in the desert. I have an incredible wife. All right, here's the next one. I promised we were going to go at this from both angles. There's also, the Bible calls husbands to honor their wives. In fact, I would even say the Bible goes into even more detail in scripture about this relationship that husbands are called to honor their wives. Let me give you three examples in scripture. First Peter 3, 7 says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. There it is super clearly. Husbands, you must give honor to your wife. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So scripture says, Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. How about Ephesians 5? It says, For husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Now that verse that's on the screen right now, this one's especially important to me because at my wedding to my wife 22 years ago, I remember this, is, this passage of scripture was what our, the officiant, he was our pastor at the time named Pastor Bo. And he, he, he talked to me, I remember directly and exhorting me at our wedding, he looked at me and said, Matt, you've got some really big shoes to fill scripture and he opened up to this verse he says scripture says that you need to love your wife the way christ loves the church and i remember even including that in my vows i promise to love you the way christ loves the church now that's an interesting vow to make because it's a vow that as you make it you're pretty much automatically saying i'm there's no way i can do this why like what i'm really saying in that vow because there's no way I can love my wife the way God loves his church, the way God loves you. I'm supposed to love my wife with that kind of perfection, with that kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it's just impossible. The shoes are too big to fill. So what I'm saying when I gave my vows to my wife is I promise to do the best job that humanly possible that I can figure out to love you the way Jesus loves his bride, the church. And so, you read scripture, even when you keep going on to that verse, it says, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. See, God willingly gave up his life for his bride. And I want to challenge the men, the husbands in this room, you ought to willingly be willing to sacrifice even up to and including your life for your bride as a way of honoring her. By the way, not the other way around. Scripture says that this is a, a man's cross to bear, to be willing to sacrifice for his family, if need be. Now, in two weeks, so next week we're going to talk about that relationship of wives to husbands. In two weeks, we're going to talk about the relationship of husbands to wives. And so we're going to do that one actually together. My wife and I, we're going we're gonna to teach that message together on stage. And I would love for you to be here as part of that. All right, number five. It's got a little bit of time left. Number five, the relationship of parents to children. You know, number one, we are talking about children are supposed to honor their parents. But you know, scripture actually calls you as parents to honor your kids. And here's how you honor your children, right? You don't want to treat your children the same way you treat everyone else in the world. Though we're called to honor everyone, we don't want to treat our family the same way we treat everyone else. I'm not required to provide for everyone else in the world. I'm not trying to keep everyone in the world warm and well-fed, but I do need to provide for my children. I need to make sure that I honor them by making sure they are in an environment where they can grow and they can thrive and they can learn who they are in Christ. 
right? So I'm not just talking about providing for them physically. I'm talking about providing for them spiritually and creating an atmosphere where that can happen in the home. We are called to honor our children by treating them with with extra honor, more honor than we treat other people outside our, our walls. See, the most important way to honor your children is to provide for their needs, both spiritual and physical. And that includes both discipleship and discipline. Have you noticed that discipleship and discipline, they're both essentially the same word. We just say them a little differently. They start off with all the same letters. They all come from the same you know, Greek root, right? Disciple and discipline. Let me read some verses to you. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, but those who won't care for their relatives, we're just talking about physical needs here, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Scripture says that if you're not providing for your children, if you're not providing for your wife, you're not providing for the needs of your family, that you are worse than an unbeliever. You got to get that figured out quick to make sure you're providing for those that you've been called to provide for. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. All right, now here's one that's a little more controversial. Proverbs 23 says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. And you might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you, there, there's a ton of research out there. I, I was looking it up this week, and it's pretty conclusive. Uh, and this is what I learned, that children who receive regular, healthy discipline, regular and healthy discipline, feel more loved and protected in the home. You might feel like, as a parent, that your strategy is, you know, I'm just trying to be their best friend. I give them what they want. When they cry and they want something, I just give it. You know, I just, I don't want to be that parent. I, I just want to, and there's no discipline in the home. There's no, nothing going on. You're just doing whatever they want, and they're just kind of ruling you. I want you to know that at the end of the day, one day when someone asks them a poll question like this, they are going to feel less loved and less protected by you because of the way you brought them up. Children who are regularly disciplined in a healthy way feel more loved and protected. Now, your question, I'm sure, is, well, what does regular and healthy look like? How do I regularly discipline my kids, and what is a healthy way to do it? That, but, boy, can we start a fight in here right now. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think. I read a verse like this, and I'll tell you why we're a spanking family in my home. Now, my girls are all older now, so we're kind of beyond that stage they're now uh, growing up. They, they love and fear God. And we have other ways of, of punishing at this point. But at the end of the day, I, I grew up in a spanking home. And I think it turned out pretty well. Um, when you, you read a verse like this, do not withhold discipline. Punish with a rod. Uh, there's a lot of people who tell you that that means something different. Uh, not when I study it. So basically, right, we understand that regular and healthy discipline, we can talk more about that. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to get some emails. We'll, we'll talk about it. All right. <laughs> Number six. Number six is another relationship of sibling to sibling. How are you supposed to interact as a sibling to another sibling in the home to create this atmosphere of honor? I got a fun question for you on your phone. This is the last one. And the question is simply this. How do you stack up against your siblings? How do you stack up against the siblings that you grew up with that maybe you have now, maybe you're answering one of these questions. Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, most of you think you're the family superstar, obviously. Um, how many of you, I see, uh, whoa, that's changing so quick. Uh, middle child lost in the shuffle as always, 18%. Where are my middle children at? I'm one of you. Uh, okay, some of you got that feeling going on. I, I, siblings, I'm an only, a spoiled only child. Where are my only children at? You never learned to share. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. We got most, most not only 6% single uh, children in here, but most of you all had some siblings, and most of you think that you are the golden child or pretty awesome. Uh, we got some black sheep, 12%. How many of you were the problem child in your home growing up? All right. 
Cool, cool. All right. Well, here's what's interesting about Scripture. Scripture doesn't say a lot about relationships between siblings. Uh, There's a couple examples of like Mary and Martha or two brothers arguing over an inheritance and different things like that. But what I do know, and one way I think I can exhort us as a church today, if you're in this room, especially if you're a child in this room and you have siblings, let me challenge you with this verse. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit from those who listen. Kids, listen, I want to challenge you that in your home, the words that come out of your mouth to one of your siblings, they need to be words that build up, that encourage, that, that bring out in them who Jesus says that they are, not that tears them down. The world is going to do that. When your sibling goes out into the world, they're going to get torn down. You should be a place that builds up in your home. You should be on the side of and in the corner of your brothers and sisters. That, that truth goes for parents to their children and children to their parents. And we need to have an atmosphere of honor where we build up with our words and not tear down. All right, so here we are at our what now God moment. I wanna invite you real quick. If you just bow your head right where you are, we say this three word prayer every Sunday. We just wanna ask God to reveal to us what it is that he wants us to do with this information. Would you just say that prayer? What now God? And as you're asking the Holy Spirit to speak into your life right now, to to give you something clear that you need to do this week, uh, if you're still staying that voice of listening, I want you to look up at me and I want to challenge you with a couple things. The obvious one that all of us should walk away with today is we want to create an atmosphere of honor in our home. We want to make sure the corners are squared on top of the firm foundation that is Jesus. But I'm sure you want to get more, you know, more specific. What is it that you need to do? And one of the things I want to challenge us to do as a church, I'm going to give you a homework assignment right now. It's called an honor list. I want you to create a list. You're going to put someone from your family that lives in your home, maybe maybe a parent that's no longer at your home. God will put on your heart who you need to do this with, but you're going to create a list. You're going to put their name at the top of a piece of paper, and you're going to write down all the reasons that you love them all the reasons why they're special to you, all the things that, you know, just never change about this person that you, that you honor and see in them. And I want you to write that list. And what's great about this list is when you've had a really bad day, you're in an argument moment, you're, you and your spouse aren't getting along, one of your kids gets on your nerves, you can pull out that list and say, you know what, this kid is bugging me, but I've made a list of all the reasons why this kid is pretty awesome. And you can read that list. Now, what I want to challenge you to do is write it down Uh, You can also gift this list. You can uh, get your kids or your your wife and say, listen, I just want to share with you what I put on this list of the reasons why I think you're amazing. Why not only am I going to honor you because you were made in the image of God, but I'm going to give you extra honor because of how amazing you are. Look at this list of all the reasons you are so worthy of honor. And I want to challenge you to, to create this atmosphere of honor in your home starting with an honor list for each member of your family. You know what I've learned? A lot of people make honor lists for others that they never share with them while they're still alive. They only write down this list because they want to say something nice at their funeral. And so don't do that. Create a list, write it down, share it. And let's create this atmosphere of honor together. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word that no matter what topic we're, we're thinking about, what topic we're teaching through, what's on our minds, there's always something you have to say about it in your word. You've revealed truth to us about how to create an atmosphere of honor in the home. Would you reveal to us more and more the things you want us to do this week and the, the things that we need, the patterns we need to change in our lives so that we can better honor those you've called us to to give extra honor to. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. 
You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.